last lecture of uh, Laurent de Villette talk, um, course, uh, about um, collision in plasmas and the Landau equation. So, please, okay, so thanks a lot. And thanks to everybody for attending the last lecture. Uh, so if you remember what we did this morning, uh, we ended up with this strange inversion formula, which in some sense enables you to transform a formula in which this quantity is given in terms of F, or more precisely of the uh, uh, derivative of F divided by F into a formula in which this derivative is given in terms of Q. Okay, so we have this inversion formula which helped us to prove the second part of Boltzmann's H theorem for the Landau equation and in fact also for the Boltzmann equation. So now the point is to try to use this formula for getting an entropy entropy dissipation uh, estimate for the Landau equation, which in some sense will uh, close the, uh, what we started at the beginning. Uh, we had this procedure in which we were first looking for an entropy, then for a strict entropy, and finally when it's possible to an entropy, a link between the entropy and the entropy dissipation. So let's do this now for the Landau equation and it's really the, the heart of the whole series of lecture. So we look for a link between entropy and entropy dissipation for Landau operator. So let me write uh, maybe the main proposition there. And it's maybe number seven, I'm not really sure. Um, Let's consider the set E of functions which are functions of V, which are non-negative, and such that the following normalization is satisfied. That is F as an integral equal to one. So this is defined on Rn. We suppose that the momentum Fv dV is equal to zero, and that the energy the kinetic energy, which is F V square over two, is equal to N over two. So this is just a normalization which enables to write down a theorem which is a little more easy to read than in the general case. So taking the F in this set, it's possible to show that the entropy dissipation uh, associated to the Landau equation when the uh, cross-section psi is the cross-section z to the square, and we will see how this ap appears naturally in the, uh, in the entropy dissipation. So this quantity here is always bigger than some constant Cf times the relative Fisher information associated to F, which is this quantity here. So this is actually the relative Fisher information associated to uh, here the uh, logarithmic gradient of the Gaussian which is centered and normalized. So here uh, one has to understand that the Gaussian, the Maxwellian we are looking for uh, in this, uh, in, in this proposition is related to these constraints here. So this is the standard uh, centered normalized Gaussian. Okay, so we want to show this and here CF is a constant which is bigger than an absolute constant which is strictly bigger than zero whenever H of F, which is the integral of F log F on Rn, is dominated by a given constant H bar. So if you prefer, Cf is bigger than a constant which depends on H bar, which is, let's say, uh, 
an upper uh, an upper bound on the possible entropy h of f. Okay, so this is really what we are looking for. That is a lower bound on the uh, uh, dissipation associated to lambda operator in terms of something that we hope to be able to link with the entropy which is defined here. So anticipating a little on the SQL, if you remember what we did for the Fokker-Planck equation, we already showed, uh, thanks to the logarithmic Sobolev inequality of growth, that this quantity is in fact bigger than this quantity minus the same quantity uh, taken at point f infinity, where f infinity is the uh, center normalized Maxwellian. So if we are able to show this, then we will have the exponential decay towards uh, equilibrium for the solution of the Landau equation with this cross section here. Okay? So this corresponds to what we want to show. And let me now show you a proof which is not really complete, but in which I will really try to uh, point out the, the, the part which, from my point of view, is the most important. So, uh, let's start from the definition of the uh, Landau dissipation, uh, entropy dissipation. I think it's written here. So, as you can see, if in this formula, in the formula that you have at the bottom of the slide, you take the function psi to be exactly z gives z to the square, you end up with the following. So let's do it in dimension n. On the slide, it's written in dimension 2, but it's the same in any dimension. So you have f of v, f of w times, now this is just v minus w to the square, and the operator pi here is just if you remember, this was also in the slides of Irene. Uh, this is a projector which is defined like this, with a notation which I hope is understandable, and which is just the projector onto the orthogonal set uh, to the vector v minus w. And so this matrix is applied as, a, let's say, a, a, a quadratic form to the vector which is here. So if you like this notation, let's say this is the matrix uh, uh, taken on the vector, and then this is uh, a scalar product with, with the vector itself. Now, if you remember, uh, so maybe the first thing to do is to uh, sorry is to uh, use a multiplication here in order to get rid of the part which is here. And you see at this level uh, what is the interest of really considering this specific cross-section, which is the only one which gives you this simplification here, and uh, we will see that it plays an important role uh, in, the, in the SQL. So, this is, now let's use, uh, let's say the standard uh, equality coming from from linear algebra, that when you have two vectors, you can uh, decompose them. I mean, you, you look at the, at the uh, uh, norm, the, L2, the, the, the Euclidean norm of x to the square. You multiply it by y to the square. Then you can write that this is the square of the scalar product plus the square of the cross product, OK? So now if you write it. In this way, you see that this quantity here 
is exactly the cross product of V minus W with gradient F over F of V minus gradient F of, of, over F of W up to, uh, up to a constant. Anyway, there is one half here. Uh, so let me not uh, compute the constant and let's write it with coordinates. So this is a sum over all possible i and j. And here I will get, uh, so v minus w i d j f over f minus d j f over f, but taken at point v and point w minus the same with indices in the, in the following way, that is first j and then i. Oops. So this is to the square and this is dv dw. Okay, so this is a just standard algebraic manipulations between the, and if you remember, this is exactly the quantity which I called QIJF of VW. So this is exactly a constant times the sum on all possible i and j. Actually, i different from j. If not, this is equal to zero, of course. So this can be rewritten in this way. W. Okay. This is just and now at this point it is a very good idea to uh, sorry come back to the formula which is written here. That is, there is a way of transforming QIJF in this quantity here, which naturally appears in the uh, relative Fisher information, which is written here. So let's just do it. Let's use the formula which is written here. I can write DIF over f of v as the, 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 those, uh, this determinant divided by the determinant which is uh, at the bottom. So the determinant at the bottom is something which does not depend on v, okay? It's a given, it's something which depends on f but which is given. So let's call it df, d like determinant, and let's say uh, to the minus one because it is under the uh, the other determinant. And the determinant above, uh, I will not write it again in detail, maybe. Or maybe yes, I don't know. So you have here, well, let's write it after all. So we have one wi wj, we, I, we have qij, we have qij times w i plus v j minus w j and q i j w j minus v i minus w i, like this. And finally, w i, w i square, w i, w j. So we can write things in this way, okay? And then I will try to start from the formula which is here and try to bound it from above, but by what I have. And what I have is exactly this, okay? So I take, uh, let's say, the absolute value of this quantity. 
and now I bound from above. If you look at this determinant, uh, you can see that uh, it's made of terms in which you have, you pick one of those things in the first column, you pick one of those terms in the last column, and then you pick one of those terms in the second column, okay? And then you do sums of this. So the number of sum is, uh, is not that high, it's a three by three determinant. So let, let it be put in the constant. And then you have uh, an integral which corresponds to the first column, so something like, which will be bounded anyway by this. Okay. Something which will be bounded by the same, but with a square, so like this. This comes out of the third column. And finally, something which comes out from the second column and which will be bounded by something like qij in absolute value times, uh, let's say, uh, 1 plus uh, W at worst. And then one has to be a little careful because of, because of those terms. Uh, but let's say the, so we have this, plus terms which are at worst like uh, at, at worst like so I forgot about the f of w here. So uh, there is maybe something like f of w times 1 plus v plus w. Oops, sorry, it's a little uh, like this. Okay? And in fact, in the determinant, you have many sums of terms like this. But now we assumed that F has a mass and an energy which is bounded by absolute constant, which are absolute constants. So this term and this term, they are just constant. And in this term, I can remove everything except the one plus V, let's see. So all of this can be bounded by something like this. So this is a constant, this is a constant. And I end up with just qij, so let me write it in a, in a completely precise way. This is something which depends on v and w. And uh, I have this 1 plus w. I have f of w to take into account. And all of this is plus 1 plus v, like this. I hope it can be understood in this way, okay? And now, what is the link between this quantity and this one? As you can see, first, this is one component of this, but then there is a V here which is missing in what I wrote down, and actually, I will not prove anything about this quantity because it's a little too uh, technical to be uh, shown in uh, such a short time, so I will look just at this quantity for the rest, okay? And then you see that in order to get what I need, I have to take the square to multiply by f and to integrate, okay, with respect to what I have here. So I will take this quantity here, I will take the square, I will multiply by f, and I will integrate in v, okay? And then, what I hope is that this can be bounded by this quantity here. Well, let's try to do it. And maybe remove all of this. But I will keep the last line. integral of gradient f over f to the square times f 
This is a quantity here in which I just eliminated the V, okay? This quantity is bounded by, so let's call the variable V. According to the inequality here, this is bounded by df to the minus one times the integral over V of the square of the integral of qij f of vw times one plus w times f of w dw, like this, plus one plus v. All of this is integrated yeah, is taken to the square and is integrated in V against F. But I hope that at this level it's clear what has to be done in order to get something like this. You see here that you have the square uh, outside of the integral, so you want to get it inside. And so the natural way to do that is to do cauchy schwarz okay? So you have to do cauchy schwarz uh, choosing in a good way the uh, what you will want, what we want to put in the square and what you want to put outside. So let's do it. Uh, let's do it uh, quietly. First, I will say that the square of the sum is less than two times the square of this one plus the square of this one. So I will have a first term which comes out from the one plus v, which is just the integral of f, one plus v, the square. V, the two has been absorbed in the constant, okay? And the second term, let's absorb the two in the constant also, is an integral, so this is an integral over Rn, so this is an integral over Rn of an integral in which I will put the square of this quantity, so like this. So I'm glad with that because it's what appears here. Then I have to put f of v and f of w, so I take the square root of f here, I put it to the square, and I get f here, so like this. And then in the second one, the square has already been used. So I will have to take the square of this one, like this. And here I used uh, half of the f. So I, I use the square root of the f. So I have to put also the f at this level. Okay. I hope I did not uh, write something wrong at this level. Uh, let me say that, yes, you have still to uh, multiply by f of v and integrate in v here. So it's like this, okay? Now, this one, this is just mass plus energy, so it's a constant. So let's say one if you put it in the df minus one. And then here, you also have a constant which is basically the same at this level. So you can regroup the integral in uh, V and W and you end up exactly with this term here. So this is for a given, yeah, so this is one point which is maybe interesting. So actually, I did not do it with the gradient, I did it with the, uh, one of the components. And then I use just one j, which is taken uh, arbitrary among the other components. So now if I want to get it for the whole gradient, then for each of the component I have to pick another one. And of course all of this is adding up here, but at the end it's just a finite number, and I can use here the whole sum on the two i and j, okay? 
So did I really solve the problem at this level? Let's have a look. Um, it remains to show a certain number of things. Uh, this is exactly uh, up to a constant d of f, okay? So this is what we, we, we computed at this level. So what we get is less than df to the minus one, one plus d uh, lando with the uh, cross section z gives z square of f. And what I would like to have is that, what I would like is to uh, remove the one here. It does not appear in the equation here. And instead of gradient f over f, I would like to have this one. So you can maybe believe me at this level that if you do it carefully, putting plus v here, this is exactly what you need to remove the one here. But it's not really direct. I mean, I could not just add it and uh, in uh, just a few minutes uh, get it in this way, okay? So I will not show more than this for this, uh, for this um, inequality. Then the last part is to control this df to the minus one. So the point is, how do I relate df to the minus one, which is this determinant that you have at the bottom here, and a quantity which has to be strictly positive when f is known to have an entropy which is less than something. So this I will not develop in detail, but this amounts to say exactly the same thing um, as I said this morning, that is, this determinant here, it's zero exactly when uh, one wi and wj are linearly dependent according to the measure f of w dw, which means that this determinant is zero when f is concentrated on a zero measure set, which is a hyperplane uh, uh, in R3. And so, uh, if you suppose that f has an entropy which is bounded uh, a priori, then thanks to the entropy structure of the Boltzmann equation, or I mean, here it's not necessary, let's say the entropy is something which is uh, controlled in L log L, and so it controls the, the way in which F can be concentrated on zero measure sets, okay? So I think it's enough to, to be convinced that this, uh, that this is working, okay? So when all of this is done, and especially when one uh, really does uh, seriously, uh, seriously puts the V here and eliminates the one, you really get this entropy-entropy dissipation estimate that I was uh, looking for uh, for now, uh, <laughs> for lectures. And uh, one ends up with the uh, theorem which is written here and which actually already appeared in a paper that Cédric Villani and I wrote together at the beginning of the 2000. Uh, that is, you suppose that F is uh, uh, basically in this set E, okay? And you can show that, provided that you take the right, the right for the computation, but not the right for physics, uh, cross-section here, you can show that the uh, Lando entropy dissipation is bigger than this quantity, which is exactly the quantity which I uh, showed uh, uh, in this, uh, on the blackboard. And then one has to remember that thanks to the Sobolev, the logarithmic Sobolev inequality of Gross, it's possible to go from here to the relative entropy with respect to the Maxwellian, which here is the centered uh, normalized Gaussian. So at the end of the day, we have really proven that the entropy dissipation is bigger than the entropy with a constant which actually depends only on an upper bound of the entropy. Uh, sorry, this is the idea of the proof. And so the consequence of this is that if you now you look at uh, a solution 
of the Landau equation, which is reasonable in the sense that uh, it satisfies uh, rigorously the entropy structure, that is, there is an entropy, there is a dissipation of entropy, and the derivative of the entropy is really the entropy dissipation, then uh, provided that the initial datum lies in the set uh, E, which is here, you can show that F converges towards its equilibrium, the center of normalized Maxwellian, uh, exponentially fast, with constants here which can be in principle computed. The first one is just, let's say, the entropy uh, minus, uh, the entropy at time t minus, at time zero minus the entropy of the, of the equilibrium, up to a constant which is related to the Kishar-Kulbach inequality, but I will not say much more here. And the constant which is here is actually related to the initial entropy because of the constant here which depends on the initial entropy. But it's possible, let's say in principle, to explicitly compute those constants. If I give you an initial datum, in principle, uh, you, could be, uh, uh, you could give me the constant which appear here. So, uh, so that was a theorem which was proven in, in, in this paper of 2000. Actually, I wanted just to say one word about the fact that thanks to a very clever link between Boltzmann entropy dissipation and Landau's entropy dissipation, especially for this cross-section, uh, Toscani and Villani, and then Villani alone a little later, were able to prove the same result, basically, for the Boltzmann equation in a special case, which is sometimes called super hard spheres. Uh, and uh, so this is also a brick in this uh, extra result. So those results usually are called Cercignani's conjecture in the literature, because they were first proposed by, by Cercignani in the 80s. So everything is perfect when you take the cross-section Z gives Z square, which is sometimes called Maxwell molecules. But unfortunately, this cross-section has nothing to do with physics, either in the Landau equation, in which you should take the Coulomb one, or in the Boltzmann equation, in which super hard spheres is something which is invented by mathematicians, but which corresponds to no gas, and which cannot correspond to any gas, actually. So all of this uh, has to be, in some sense, extended to cases which have to do with physics. And so that was the, the, the work that I tried to perform uh, more recently. And uh, actually, I was able to do it only in the case of the Landau equation. And in the case of the Boltzmann equation, my hope was that it was possible to use this link obtained by Toscani and Villani some time ago to get better results for the just any conjecture for the Boltzmann equation, but up to now I have not been able to, to obtain it, so I will present something only on the Landau equation. Uh, let me begin maybe by uh, this uh, inequality here. So for this last part of the lecture, uh, I will go faster, I will show only slides, so I hope you will forgive me. <laughs> uh, the, let's say the extension to the case of uh, the Landau equation with the true uh, Coulomb interaction, which is represented here by V minus V, V minus W to the minus one, takes this form here, which is not uh, as beautiful as, the, as what was obtained for this uh, specific cross section. So you can have a look to the differences. This is exactly the same as here. So there is no difference at this point. But inside the uh, relative Fisher information, you have now this extra weight, which is very bad when V is large. Because when V is large, uh, this will be small, and so this is not as good as having a constant here. And so in some sense, in the case of the Landau interaction, you have problems with large velocities which is something which has been known for a very long time, but uh, large velocities are problematic for the, for the, for the Landau equation with, uh, with Coulomb interaction. So that's the first thing. But then you also have in the, in the computation, actually it's in the computation which corresponds to what I wrote there basically when you are doing the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and things like that. In that case, 
uh, you have to, pro to use a moment of f, which is of much higher order than the second moment, which is here, and for which we know that there is propagation and actually conservation for the Landau equation. So you have here a quantity which is not naturally conserved by the evolution of the Landau equation with Coulomb interaction. Okay, so you have two difficulties, if you wish. One which is related to this weight, and one which is related to this extra moment that you need in order to get an inequality. But what I would like to emphasize is that this result, which I obtained, uh, I mean, one year before, so it, it was in this paper here, so it was two years before the, the, this paper appeared. Um, so this, uh, this inequality um, is uh, obtained rather quickly from what we saw uh, uh, together in the two last lectures uh, by modifying the weights, the coefficients, etc which was not really apparent in the proof that we did together with Cédric Villani in 2000, which was based mainly, I would say, on basically the same ingredients, but in which we did not really identify this inversion formula between Q and uh, gradient F over F. So the new, I would say that the, the real improvement here is really this inversion formula, which in some sense makes it uh, quite easy to do new proofs if you give me something which looks like the Landau equation. Uh, and so now I think that we have really something which is really robust. But of course, if you use it in cases in which there are troubles, you will find the trouble somewhere in the inequality anyway. Okay. Uh, so that is what is obtained at the level of the of the Coulomb potential. My feeling is that this is optimal, so I'm not completely sure, but my feeling is that this is optimal, that is, you cannot remove the weight and you cannot remove the moment. I'm not completely sure, but I would be very surprised if this were not, op not optimal in this setting. Uh, how can we use this in order to produce a large time, a large time uh, behavior result for the Landau equation in the most interesting case, which is the Coulomb case. So this was obtained in a paper that uh, I wrote together with uh, Kleber Carapatoso and Ling Ming He uh, last year. And in fact, which was recently uh, uh, improved, I will explain then how by Kleber Carapatoso and Stefan Michler very recently. Uh, and which says basically the following. Now you look at the Landau equation with uh, the Coulomb potential, which is represented here, so the real physical Landau equation, and you take an initial datum which has an entropy, but which also has a lot of moments. So here this means that you have an exponential, a stretch exponential function which is integrable against the initial datum. So it's a lot of extra assumptions with respect to the theorem that could be produced thanks to this inequality here. Then there exists a global weak solution of the Landau equation. Uh, so this was known from the previous paper and it's possible to, at this level, to eliminate the notion of H solutions which was invented by uh, Cédric Villani in the late 90s, uh, thanks to something which I will maybe take some time to explain uh, at the very end of the lecture. Uh, so anyway, there is, a good, there is a, a good weak solution, let's say, for the, for the equation. And the, it's possible to show the following large time behavior estimate that F converges towards the centered normalized uh, Gaussian in L1 with a rate which is not exponential, but which is uh, still not far from being exponential in the sense that you have here exponential to the minus t to some power. So the power here is one over seven, and there is a small logarithmic correction that you can forget. Um, moreover, the constant here is something that can be completely computed if you know well the uh, initial datum. Like, for example, if you know uh, this uh, uh, L1 norm in, in a good weighted space. Um, and the rate can be improved if you suppose uh, uh, some more things on the initial datum. This is a contribution of uh, Carapatoso and Michler in this, um, in this uh, theorem. So be more precise, 
this rate is not optimal. And so in, the, in, in their work, they were able to obtain an optimal rate, which I think is exponential minus t to the two-third, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, the optimal rate is not exponential convergence. Okay? It's a different power here. And this has been known since at least Kaflisch in the 80s, because when you linearize, you see that. You see that there is no spectral gap, that you have some, uh, some difficulty with weights, and you can somehow uh, compute a priori the rate that you want to get. So the way to go from this result to, the, to, to this result consists actually in uh, using this result up to a certain time t in which you enter a small neighborhood of m in a norm which is like this one, let's say L1, and then to do a spectral analysis, so uh, 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 you linearize, you do a spectral analysis around, the, around M, but this spectral analysis is done in a space which is not L1. It's done in a space which is much smaller, which is basically L2 uh, with a weight which is Gaussian, which is a natural space, let's say, for the linearized equation. And then you have to play uh, a game, which is a rather technical one, in order to see that the spectrums, the spectra, are not uh, very different when you extend your space from L2 with a Gaussian weight to L1. And this is something which was, I think, first proposed by uh, uh, Clément Mouault. Um, I think that was uh, Stéphane Michler. And also, uh, who was the third one? Should have noted it, maybe I did at the end. Uh, yes, Maria Pia, Maria Pia Gualdani. Yeah. So it's actually this paper here. So this was, this was uh, uh, first proposed in 2013, and actually in this case, one has to use a quite refined version of this first uh, um, result here, because it's, you do not get an, an exponential uh, decay at the end. You, you obtain a decay which is like straight exponential. Uh, so this is what I wanted to, to, to show for the uh, Coulomb case. Let me say that among the ingredients, there is so this entropy, entropy dissipation estimate, but I would like to show also the two or three other ingredients which enable to get the, the stretch exponential decay. So, the next ingredient is a bakri emery version of the Sobolev logarithmic inequality. And uh, this is something which is related to the weight that appears in the, in the Fisher information. Uh, here you had the standard uh, Fisher information, relative Fisher information. And so the, Sobolev, the, log, the log Sobolev inequality you have to use is a standard one, which is the gross Sobolev, log Sobolev inequality. Here, because of the weight, you need to use this refined version, which is due to Bakri and Emery. So that is the second ingredient which has to be used, which was not used in the case, uh, in the non-physical case. That's it. Uh, then there is uh, a theory of propagation of moments in this specific case of the Landau equation. And to be more precise, one needs to propagate moments which are uh, stretchly, stretched exponential weighted moments, to be precise. So one has to show that those moments do not grow too fast with time, like they must grow less than exponentially, typically. And in fact, it's possible to show that they grow at most like 1 plus t. So that is a second ingredient which has to be used uh, in the proof. And the last ingredient I would like to show to you, actually there are two more ingredients, so let me show the very last, if I wrote it, no. So let me show this one. Uh, when you do the, the computations, you see that at some point, you have to control not only the L1 moment, the, the stretch exponential L1 moment, but actually, a moment of f log f. That is something which appeared already in the old papers by Toscani and Villani from the late 90s, that such moments are important for, uh, for that kind of computations. 
And here it happened that we had to control those moments. So the idea was to try to interpolate uh, cleverly between moments in L1, which are here, of the same kind of quantities, and extra regularity on F. And so this is uh, given by the formula, the interpolation formula here. And uh, this extra regularity is actually something which is itself computed from the same, from the same uh, uh, estimate here. And this is the last thing I would like to present to you uh, in these lectures. That is, this entropy, entropy dissipation estimate does not only tell you that you will converge fast towards the equilibrium, it also tells you something on the regularity of the solutions of the equation. So let me show to you very briefly how it works. One corollary of this which is very simple to, to get is that the entropy dissipation associated to the equation is bigger than a constant which depends on the same quantities times, uh, I hope I will not be, uh, times the uh, integral in L3 of F. If I'm not mistaken, we should have this. I hope I did not make mistake with the exponents, but I think it's okay. Eh? This one is uh, like gradient f to the square over f, so it's linear in terms of f, and it's also the case here. So as you can see, when you know that the uh, entropy dissipation uh, is bounded, you will know that f is naturally in L3. And so the reason for this is a direct, uh, let's say, uh, Sobolev inequality, because this is a Fisher information. So let's say proof, if you wish, but this is really just two lines. Uh, when you have that gradient f to the square over f is bounded, so this is a quantity here, if you forget about the v, you can write this as a constant times the gradient of the square root of f to the square. And then you can do uh, a Sobolev uh, inequality in, from h1 to l6 because you are in dimension three. Okay, so this is only for dimension three. So this will be bigger than a constant times square root of f in norm l6 to the square, okay? And this is nothing but what I have written here, okay? So it's quite natural that solutions of the Landau equation uh, will have an entropy dissipation which is bounded once you integrate in time. And so they will naturally leave in L1 in time with value in L3 in V, okay? So then when you deal with the equation itself, you have at your disposal this L3 norm. But here, I did everything in the setting of the bad, the good for mass, but the bad for physics uh, cross-section. And so no weights appears. Unfortunately, in the Coulomb case, there are weights. And so there is this minus three here, which appears, which is a weight uh, related to the L3 norm, which is a negative weight. And it's only this that you can control when you look at the entropy dissipation with the Coulomb potential. So you have some loss also at this level in this case. So as you can see, uh, one also needs a, a certain uh, number of interpolations. And here, this one is actually not very hard to get. You have to interpolate between weights and regularity in order to do uh, things. So actually, the last uh, ingredient, which is not written in my slides, 
uh, is a sort of uh, treatment of the differential inequalities that you get at the end in which it's not really a direct Grandois argument as we saw in the first lecture. It's a variant which is much more complicated, but which is uh, once you know what you want to get that you can really handle. And at the end, because of this, you do not get uh, the exponential decay, but this uh, stretch exponential decay that I um, presented. Okay, let me uh, maybe finish by uh, saying a few words about uh, our recent progresses on the, on the same subject. So actually, the group which has been working a lot on this um, is uh, the group uh, which is uh, uh, based in Dauphine and Cambridge, I would say, here. Uh, Maria Pia, I think she's Washington now, but uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Kleber at that time was also in, uh, in Dauphine. Uh, Daniela, of course, is, she's in Dauphine. And uh, Isabel was, uh, Isabel Tristani was also in Dauphine. She's now uh, in ENS Ulm. Uh, okay, anyway, <laughs> they really all work systematically to get the best possible decay for uh, uh, spatially homogeneous or spatially inhomogeneous kinetic equations with, uh, um, with a, a collision operator, so either Boltzmann or Lando, and you can see that First was treated the case, which is maybe the, 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 the most traditional one, that is Boltzmann with angular cutoff and hard potentials. I don't want to discuss too much what this means, but this is, that is the most traditional Boltzmann equation. Uh, Irene presented uh, moderate soft potentials and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not moderate <laughs> soft potentials. <laughs> I would say. So this was uh, obtained a little later in the case of the Lando equation. And uh, also the case uh, of the spatially inhomogeneous uh, equation uh, with data close to equilibrium uh, was treated recently uh, uh, by Hero, Tono, and Tristani. And uh, maybe the most recent one, I those two ones were appeared re really recently anyway. So uh, is uh, this extension of what I presented now by uh, Carapatoso and Michelin. And all of them, all of these results are based on these uh, spectral gaps in enlarged spaces, which I did not present at all in the, in the lectures, but which I think are a very uh, interesting tool in order to get, uh, let's say, optimal results of convergence towards the equilibrium, and which marry, marry very well with this entropy uh, uh, let's say, business, uh, since usually um, the, the best way to, to, to get the optimal rate consists in first using an entropy method which tells you that in an amount of time that you can control, you will get close to the, to the equilibrium, you will get in a small neighborhood of the equilibrium, and then you finish by using uh, linearized theory and this uh, enlarged spaces uh, uh, theory. So I think maybe uh, I will stop now. I think it's a good time maybe to stop with the lecture. <laughs>